So next we have uh, campaigners Caroline Criado Perez and Tracy King, who are going to talk about how online campaigners are bringing offline changes. Caroline Criado Perez is a writer, broadcaster, and award-winning feminist campaigner. Her first book, Do It Like a Woman, was published by Portobello in 2015. She is currently working on her second book, which will be about the gender data gap. Tracy King is a writer and producer. Uh, she is best known for her science outreach projects, including the viral animation and best-selling graphic novel Tim Minchin's Storm and astronaut Chris Hadfield's It's Not Rocket Science. She writes an, a monthly print column on digital and technology culture in Custom PC magazine. We're really good friends. We met on Twitter, and which uh, actually I met quite a lot of my real life friends on Twitter, which is a really nice thing. And, and I was listening to what uh, Graham Linehan and Helen Lewis were saying, um, which is that Twitter's kind of become a bit of a cesspool um, to a certain degree, and and it has. But uh, it, for me. Uh, as somebody who is very active in uh, trying to push uh, campaigns for marginalised people, um, feminist politics, etc., it's still an incredibly valuable tool. So I kind of wanted to talk a bit more about like the positive side of things because social media has been a gift for marginalised voices, uh, and I don't think anybody exemplifies that more than Caroline. Uh, so I'm, I, my notes on here, I'm not just randomly texting. Um, <laughs> on stage, lol. Uh, so, <laughs> so you may know Caroline from the, most famously from the banknote campaign. So Caroline uh, campaigned to get a woman onto our banknote. Uh, it's so people think you campaigned specifically to get Jane Austen on the banknote, yeah. and that's not the case. No. You just said a woman. It's really annoying. Could have been any woman. <laughs> but you are also just a massive... Just because, you know, and I, I always feel really bad about this, because when people say, oh, she campaigned to get Jane Austen on a banknote, that completely changes the tenor of the campaign from a female representation campaign and how we treat women in public life and, and how we value them in our public culture and how we remember them to a Jane Austen fangirl campaign. <laughs> and the thing that is really difficult is I actually I am also a Jane Austen fangirl. So, you know, trying to explain both that I am a fangirl, but I, that wasn't a fangirl campaign. Like, it's just, it's quite complicated and upsetting for me. So... If everyone here ever sees it described as, you know, can you just please get on in there so I don't have to do the whole, well, I am a fangirl, but, yeah. But it did work out quite nicely for you in the end. It wasn't somebody... It would have been awful if they'd put Thatcher on there or something. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that so was I, backfired. I was, I was very... Um, was she dead by that time? Oh, she's always been dead. I am not... <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, well, I, I actually very cannily, I thought, I thought very cannily for me, sidestepped the Margaret Thatcher issue with my, n my next sort of big campaign, which was to get a statue um, of a woman in Parliament Square. Because when I... So I started the campaign because I ran through Parliament Square and I realised, sorry, I know that I'm probably... No, no, ahead, it's right. Um, and realised... And it was on International Women's Day, and I'd just been doing a panel about, you know, the lack of representation of women. And actually, at the end of that panel, someone came from the audience came up and said, you know, what's your next campaign going to be on? Which people often ask me, and I explained, well, I don't know, because, you know, the only time I sort of feel like I can handle taking on a campaign... You know, you have to actually be slightly mad to do it, because it takes over your life, and it's just horrific. And you don't get paid for it, and it's just exhausting. Um, and so you have to just have a moment of losing your mind to decide to do it. Um, so I don't know when the next time I'm going to lose my mind is, um, but that will be what my next campaign will be. But also at the time, you know, I was just, I didn't have time to start a campaign. I was trying to earn enough money from freelance journalism to survive. So I just sort of said, you know, probably I'm not going to be campaigning for a while. Anyway, for half an hour later, as I was running from one speech to the other, um, I ran through Parliament Square, and for the first time, despite having been in Parliament Square many, many times before, I looked at the statues and thought, hang on a minute, I think they're all men. And I, and I just also thought, well, this is... I think it was 2016 then, and I just thought, we can't be in 2016 and all the statues here of men. I mean, surely someone's done something about this, right? Like, this is embarrassing. Um, but yeah, I went and I looked at all of them and they were, they were all of men. Anyway, I uh, sort of sent out a tweet saying we should have um, 
there are, there are no statues of women up here, we should have one. Um, and I specifically said, why don't we put up a statue of um, a woman involved in the fight for suffrage? Partly because I knew the centenary was coming up, but also because that just completely sidestepped the Thatcher issue. Mm. Because I, but if you do say, I want a woman represented, inevitably you will have people who, just to troll you, will say, what about Thatcher? And you're like, well, okay, she was a woman, but there are a lot of other women. You know, she wasn't the only woman ever to ever have existed. Um, but for some, for some people, she is the only woman to ever have existed. Um, so, yeah, that was, that's not the only reason I, <laughs> I campaigned for um, a suffragette suffragist. Um, but uh, it's certainly... Let's just say it was a canny move on my part. So that, and that's ongoing, that campaign is ongoing, but there is yeah. going to be a statue and it's going to be of there Millicent is, Fawcett. It's going to be of Millicent Fawcett. I'm saying um, this like I don't know. I've been working with Caroline on the campaign and I've seen what, the work that goes into it. And it, it's not just sending a tweet. No. It's, really it's very much not just... So what, what were the steps? You sent, you sent a tweet okay, saying... Okay, so I sent great. a tweet and then um, I sort of... I kind of sent the tweet... In fact, I, I remember I did this in my last campaign as well. I sent a tweet hoping someone else would do the campaign. Um, so for the banknotes, I sent it to Everyday Sexism and was like, hey, this is a bit of Everyday Sexism. Maybe you'd like to campaign on it. And uh, I don't know, Laura didn't reply. Um, so I was like, oh, for God's sake. So I started up a petition. Um, and similarly, I sent out this tweet about um, Parliament Square and carried on with my run, you know, having just said, no, I really don't have time to start a campaign right now. Um, and I realised as I was circling Green Park, I was actually com composing the campaign text in my head. Um, so I, I set up the petition on my mobile. Um, I kind of missed the question about mobiles versus computers earlier, but uh, yeah, there you go. There's an example of a mobile also functioning as a computer, but on the move. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I set it up and that was the beginning. And the beginning is that you get as many signatures as you can. Um, and I think, sorry, it's very hot up here, so I'm just going to tie my hair up. Um, you know, I think people have a sort of, because that's the most public part of campaigning, um, people who haven't done campaigning before think that that's all there is to it. And I'm very sorry to inform you that that is not, not the case. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, obviously every campaign is different as well. Um, so for the Jane Austen campaign because it was much more adversarial than this campaign ended up being. It was much more about getting together a group of people, which is what um, an online petition is these days. It's actually a database. It's a database of people who have said, I care about this issue and I'm prepared to fight with you on it. And so you can mobilise those people because you have their email addresses. Um, obviously, you can unsubscribe any time, but no one ever did because I write such great emails. Um, so... That was, that was that campaign, was more about getting people to tweet and, and write their, to their MPs, turn up to um, protests outside the Bank of England. Um, and I had, I had only two meetings with the Bank of England before um, you know, the decision was, was made to put Jane Austen on the £10 note. With this campaign, um, there was much less of a public face of this is what's going on now. Um, so the, the next thing I did was organise an open letter signed by a whole bunch of high-profile women um, to actors, writers, uh, MPs, lords, um, ladies. ladies, whatever. <laughs> what, what's a female lord? Is it a lady? This sounds Do weird. You? Lady, isn't it a baroness? I don't, I don't know. know. Whatever. Oh, it's, it's not my <laughs> world. <laughs> um, yeah, so to sign an open letter um, to Sadiq Khan, which was published uh, when he became mayor of London. And then from that point on, the campaign went into millions of meetings at City Hall, um, which was, uh, you know, great. And they were, uh, they were great. Um, but there were a lot of... Um, I don't know, it just turns out there's a lot of stuff to do to get red tape. a statue If you, if you want to change the landscape yeah, of London, you have to fill in a hell of a lot of bureaucracy and red so tape. You mentioned... and, sort of, and also things that you think are obvious, <coughs> having to make sure that they happen. So for me, when I set up the campaign, it was just obvious it was going to be of um, a woman. 
it was going to be a statue where it was a figurative statue. So it was clear that it was a woman. It was also going to be a named woman. So it's not just sort of every woman. Because um, the problem with... And it was also going to be a closed woman. Because it turns out, statues like that, so named historical woman where it's actually a woman, um, make up 2.7% of all the statues in the UK. And I know that because I spent a really fun weekend counting all of them. Um, I counted 925 statues. Uh, and it's all men named John. Isn't it? The, and there are, in fact, yeah. more, 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 more statues of men named John than there are statues of female historical figures. Um, is uh, it the same John? Is it just like, just there's one, like I, one Do you know powerful... what? I did not go that far into the data. <laughs> John um, I was just like, John's are all the same to me. I just, whatever, just John. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but that, that wasn't obvious. Um, and so, you know, I had to make it very clear that, no, this is the statue that we're doing. So, you know, City Hall were great, but obviously I had a very specific vision of what I felt the statue should be from a feminist perspective, and also knowing the kind of criticisms that we would get from the feminist community, which I don't think... Sid, like, kudos to him, Sadiq Khan says he's a feminist mayor, and he, I'm sure he is, but he's not so intimately involved with... Um, the intricacies of feminism as perhaps we are. Um, and so we were able to anticipate things that people might not, be very, might not react very well to. Um, but yeah, we had sort of designs sent in that were naked, and it was just like, but we specifically said no. Uh, designs sent in that were of just sort of random, every women. Um, it was just, yeah, it was baffling. Anyway, it's, it's taken a year and a half of my life away. So you talked about adversary. So um, uh, as well as the banknote and the statue, there's other campaigns that you did. For example, you were instrumental in getting Twitter to improve the abuse report function, uh, mm -hmm. partly as a result of the abuse that you'd had, but also because it was very clear that it was just not fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, and so you put a lot of pressure on Twitter, and as a result of your campaigning, they changed it. You did a campaign to get mother's names on birth certificates. You did a major fundraiser. No, marriage certificates. Marriage certificates, yes, I did that. I think they are on birth certificates. <laughs> not just having just given birth myself, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you did a major fundraiser for Medicine Sans Frontier because, again, you got annoyed because there were some far-right people. I did right get people. really yeah. annoyed. So some far-right people basically <laughs> would raise money to go out and disrupt rescue efforts, um, migrant rescue efforts in the sea, and Caroline I was just like, no. I just thought it was disgusting. So you, it was really yeah, disgusting. Yeah, so you did a huge fundraiser and, and it, to the point where you raised so much money that Medicine Sans Frontier <laughs> said, stop sending us money, we can't spend all this. Just cut, they, I mean, they were really, they were lovely. They were really grateful. They said it was a really sort of gentle way of like, okay, but please, when you've reached this amount, can you just stop? Because <laughs> so, but what these, what these things have in common? Twitter, Bank of England, the government. That is huge, huge, huge bodies, right? Immovable bodies. And I think, you know, most of us here, we wouldn't dream of getting up on the average Tuesday and going and tackling the government or the Bank of England. Um, and you. One woman, you just force these huge, powerful bodies to do stuff that they don't want to do. So, I, I mean, I, I guess my question is like, what? Well, you know, I don't feel like I'd have the right to do that, but I take the inspiration from you that anybody has the right to do that. So, what led you to the point where you just decided you've got the right to do that? Oh. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I'm just a really uppity female. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, <laughs> oh, good. so. So it starts with a tweet, and then it's... It starts with rage. Yeah, and then and a tweet, and then a petition. Yeah. But most petitions fail. They die on their mm. ass. Why is that? Um, God, so many reasons. Uh, I think that you need to be... I mean, a petition isn't always the right vehicle for a campaign, is the first thing to say. Um, there are petitions that I get sent, and I just think, why are you using petition for this? This is completely the wrong vehicle for it. And there are other campaigns that I have bubbling away that there's no way I'm going to do a petition on um, because they're completely inappropriate for a petition. It doesn't, it's not a sort of huge public swell of movement thing. It's a legislative process thing. Um, so first of all, there's that, is making sure that your campaign actually suits a petition. Um, the second thing is, I think, making sure... This kind of ties into the first thing, is that people often have petitions that are far too loose and baggy. So... I mean, not that I've actually seen a petition like this, but if, for example, someone were to set up a, a petition saying, end patriarchy, um, that's not a suitable vehicle <laughs> because 
who's in charge of patriarchy? Well, there's no like top patriarch. Maybe it's <laughs> Donald Trump, but like he's not going to listen to a petition. Um, so there's no top patriarch. There's no single thing that is happening that creates patriarchy. Um, there is no single solution. So a petition is basically a single issue campaign. That's what a petition is for. Um, and I think a lot of people set up campaigns about things that aren't single issue campaigns. Um, and that's why they fail, because that's not what a petition is for. So first of all, it's that. But then it's also things like, um, how have you written your campaign text? How have you made it seem that this should matter to someone? Um, I think quite often when someone really, really cares about something, um, they just sort of think everyone else cares about it too. And that's just not the case, because if everyone cared about it, you wouldn't have to campaign on it. Um, so it's about thinking about how am I going to get someone who doesn't know anything about this to suddenly want to make it their problem. Um, and I think, again, that's something that a lot of petition texts that I've seen don't do. They have this sort of tone sometimes of um, sort of weariness at how terrible everything is and how terrible everyone is. And nobody's really going to respond to that. You know, you need to be writing in a way that's saying, come on, guys, there's this thing, and it's no good, but we're going to change it, and this is going to be awesome. Um, you know, I've seen petitions start with things like, we are very disappointed to see. No, no one's going to read the rest of that. They're just going to turn off. Um, so that's, that's another reason. What was the question? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> why do campaigns fail or why do petitions why fail? Why do petitions fail? Why yes. do petitions there are fail? so many of them. So, them so fail. right, so there's that. Um, then there's also people not understanding that petitions have changed from what they were when they were on a piece of paper. Um, so as I said before, that's basically just a big database now. It's a movement. That's how you need to think of an online petition. Online petition is a movement. Um, if you think of it just as a collection of names, you're not going to do anything with it. Um, because ultimately, the petition is not the campaign. The petition is your data. Um, the campaign is everything that you do with that data. And again, I think that's something that people don't understand. And again, it's partly because, as with the statue campaign, what everyone saw was just the petition. So for as far as they're concerned, I got a statue because I did a petition and I got a letter in the Telegraph. Well, actually what happened was I was going to meetings at City Hall every week um, and spending hours talking to... Um, local government <coughs> officials and talking to uh, architects and talking to uh, landscape whatevers. Did you know that the district line runs diagonally across Parliament Square? I didn't know that. Uh, you also had to talk to tree people. There tree people. Historic trees or something, <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, all of that has to be done in order for the campaign to succeed. Um, and if you think that you're just going to set up a petition and someone is going to, the person in charge that you've directed it to is going to say, oh, okay then, then you're in for a disappointment. One other thing I would say is that um, it also matters who you direct the petition at in that um, make sure that that really is the person 100% responsible for the decision. So you'll see a lot of petitions aimed at whoever the prime minister at the time is, um, which would be much better aimed at the minister you know, heading up a specific department um, or even like, you know, a local council. But people sort of want to go right to the very top. Well, the reality is power's delegated and maybe Theresa May could do something about, let's say, the sewage in your street. I don't know why I came up with that. But anyway, but she's not going to. She's just not, it's not going to get to her. Um, so, yeah, I would say those are the things that are the most common pitfalls that I see. And so along those lines, because one of the things I find, if I'm angry about something, it, it, it's often politically charged. So, for example, you know, being, being a left-leaning person, I'm quite angry about something that the government has done. And that automatically makes me not want to work with the government. But one of the hallmarks of your campaigning is that you work with people that you are not politically aligned with, that you, that yeah. you have to compromise. So, you know, how does that work in terms of, like, do you just hold your nose and wade in? Or do you... Um... <laughs> I, don't I know you're I'm... a Tory, but can I have this? Um, no, I don't think that... I think you have to approach each... You know, cases you find it, approach each person with an open mind and a sense that, well, I hope we're going to be able to find common ground that we can work on this together. Um, and I guess, in fact, actually, I think that's another reason that campaigns fail, is when people aren't prepared to put purity aside for a common goal. 
Um, and that's not to say you should work with absolutely anyone. So um, I had a discussion with someone recently where they were sort of saying, feminists are so stupid for not working with the Christian right um, uh, because they both want... I can't, exactly, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was probably something to do with porn or something. And, um, you know, I said, well, no, because actually maybe certain feminists and certain Christian right do want to get rid of one particular thing. But if feminists want to get rid of something because they want to make women more free and Christian fundamentalists want to get rid of it because they want to, you know, narrow women's lives, then you can't work together. So you, you have to work with people where not only do you want the same thing, but you want the same thing for the same reasons. Um, but you can want the same thing as someone for the same reasons while disagreeing with them on pretty much everything else. Um, so uh, uh, Danny Finkelstein um, is uh, a, a, a Tory lord who I worked with on the um, statue campaign. And uh, I must admit, I've not really discussed economics with him, <laughs> but um, I think it's likely we don't particularly subscribe to the same views. Um, but that doesn't mean that we both don't see that having a female statue in Parliament Square is incredibly important. Um, so so it's, it's just about you know, finding who your allies are and where they are. And, you have to be prepared to work with different people and across different political values if you're going to be able to get anything done because that's just the way the world works. It's no good only talking to people who already agree with you. You won't ever change anything that way. You need to be able to work with people who don't agree with you on everything um, and people who don't agree with you at all if you can manage to change their mind because um, ultimately that's what campaigning is about. It's about changing people's mind so that you can change the world. Yours is going ahead, the Statue of Millicent Fawcett. Yeah. going ahead, designed by the amazing Gillian Waring. Yes. Uh, and so when is that going to be unveiled? Well, so the plan is for it to be unveiled on the 6th of February, uh, which is the centenary of the 1918 representation uh, of the People Act. Um, but we're on a really, really tight schedule. So uh, it basically, if anything goes wrong, um, we have three minutes, guys. Five minutes. Well, you're holding your hand over the number, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have minutes. We have minutes. Hey. Some minutes to go. Um, <coughs> so can I? So yeah. So basically, can if you can just like hold off from protesting in Parliament Square until February, that would be that would really help us out. Super so if we can sort of bring it back, then all of that is achieved by getting angry, sending a tweet, starting a petition. That you know, and, and that that tool is available for everybody. Yes. Um, uh, ideally, if they follow some of the guidelines that you've set out. So, uh, you know, I, see, I do see Twitter as a force for good. It's, you know, marginalised voices, but, you know, people like you and I would not ordinarily be able to get stuff done. And so social media has given us... We, we've taken a platform. It's not given it to us. We've taken yeah. a platform for ourselves where, you know, we didn't have newspaper columns or, you know, friends in high places, etc. Um, and, and so it does democratise in that way. So... Um, it, that also means that like Nazis can find each other and mobilise and yeah. become president or whatever. Um, <laughs> didn't say that. Um, but we have that too. And, and you know, I worry about the brain drain. I worry about the, you know, the good people leaving mm. and just sort of leaving it to, you know, to fester with the Nazis to mobilise mm. there. Because actually I think that you know, if we just sort of stand our ground and say, no, actually we're achieving stuff here and we're finding each other. And you, know, you and I would never have found each other. We come from very different worlds. Yeah, um, I... I think that, um, you know, it is, it is a huge concern, but I, I'm afraid that women of our generation just kind of have to suck it up for a bit. Because, which is not to excuse what's going on, but, you know, when you think about... Like, let's just think about how ridiculous it is for someone to sit down and send me a really graphic rape, death, mutilation threat for getting a line drawing of a woman on a piece of paper, which is, you know, in essence what it was. Um, what is going on in your head to send that? Um, it just seemed very, very clear to me, um, as with all types of reactions of that sort, that it's about um, fear. So they are trying to frighten me away from getting more representation of women, why are they trying to frighten me away from doing that? Because they're scared of more representation of women. They're scared of what that means for them. They're scared of what that means for their masculinity. Um, and the problem is we haven't got to a position where it's just normal to have 
50% of women in films, 50% of women in parliament, 50% of women um, on banknotes. <laughs> we haven't got there yet. 50% uh, of women everywhere. Because obviously there are 50% of women everywhere. But in any position of power, in any position of um, you know, cultural value, it's around 20 to 30%. Um, and until it becomes as common to see a woman uh, in a position of leadership, in a position of power, um, represented anywhere, uh, you know, leading a superhero film, for God's sake, um, we're going to carry on getting this. So, unfortunately for us, we're not there yet. We're still fighting for that to happen, and so we're going to carry on getting that backlash. Um, and I don't really have, you know, there isn't a solution to it, because the, the solution is for men to stop being scared of women. So do you um, think, then, it's a luxury for men to be able to leave social media because they don't actually need it to achieve? Uh, why? Who's left social media? Oh, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I think, so, you know, men need social media too, not necessarily from a campaigning, a feminist campaigning perspective, but, I mean, I don't just need it for campaigning. I need it for my writing, for example. Yeah. Like, if you're a journalist, you kind of have to be on social media. Um, if you're in politics, you kind of have to be on social media. So um, they, you know, they need it for those reasons as well. Um, but I guess, yeah, like men can leave social media because they don't like the misogyny without having to pay too high a price from leaving the misogyny there, I guess. So what, what would be your kind of... Uh, over our, if, if there's a takeaway message, just in terms of if anybody's thinking, I'm going to start a petition, or I'm going to send a tweet, or I want this. I'm going to send a tweet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a, an angry tweet about some perceived injustice. Uh, is there like one overarching piece of advice that you would give people to, to sort of leverage the power of social media for, <sighs> for social good? So you're asking me how to produce clickbait? I'm asking you how to be you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. How 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 do you, um... how to be you? <laughs> Um, I'm I, going to tweet you and say, can you do it for me? Because I know that drives you mad. Oh, God, I get that quite a lot. Please <laughs> don't ask me to campaign on your behalf. If you have something... In fact, that's the number one thing to take away. If you care about something, you campaign on it, all right? I'm not your performing campaign monkey. <laughs> You're my performing campaign monkey. I think we can leave it there. <laughs>